words A strange and lovely sound I hear it in the thunder and the rain There's rain in the skies The cannons in the night The music of the universe plays We're singing that you are holy stars be clear who you are and I'm so unworthy still you love forever my heart will sing of how great you are a beautiful and free You're reaching far beyond the Milky Way It's joining with the sound Come on, let's sing it out It's the music of the universe plays We're singing the you are holy You're great and mighty The moon and the stars
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you Yeah. 
Sun comes up. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be seen when the
pray that we're found faithful on this day. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will see all the race unending. Two thousand years and People said, Amen. It's time young be seated. When we closed this last Sunday, they were burying two pretenders. It's pretty serious, isn't it? Two pretenders that had gone to church and pretended to be all in. And last Sunday, we closed with that scene Ananias and Sapphira. I asked you a question last week. I'm going to open with it, the same question today. Would you join that church? Would you join that church knowing that the pretenders in the church, well, they buried them last Sunday? Would you want to go hear Peter preach knowing how all that turned out in that particular service? These are real questions. Is there another church? If we don't join that one, can we, can we find one that's more tolerable, more inclusive? That's where we pick up the story today in Acts chapter 5. What will happen when the church gets serious? It's a real question for today. What, what would happen if the church got serious? And what would happen if the church got pruned? Pruned, that he cut off the unfruitful branches that he cut off the pretenders. What would happen? What happened if the church, if he prunes it, Jesus says after the pruning, it'll bear much fruit. I can tell you this, carrying the bodies out of two pretenders is a serious moment. That kind of pruning will get you serious, and that kind of pruning will get you serious or you'll leave. It's unlikely you'll just stay and watch. Let's see what happens next in this unstoppable movement of God called the church. I've told you on several occasions, I'm preaching now through this book of Acts, and the word Acts gets its name, the book of Acts gets its name from the Acts of the Apostles, of what the Apostles acted like. In reality, it's what the church acted like as the church was born. And I told you on several occasions, here's my dilemma when I study the book of Acts, I cannot see the modern American church looking anything like the church in the book of Acts. We don't look the same. Something's wrong. So I want to see what happens next in this unstoppable movement of God called the church. Did you know that nothing will stop the church? Not the true church. Verse 12, Acts chapter 5. The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers were meeting together, meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. 
but no one else dared join them. Why, why are they afraid? I ask you, would you join this church? They were obviously asking the same question. No one else dared join them. Even though all the people had high regard for them, they were kind of afraid to jump in. God is demonstrating supernatural power through the apostles and the believers, and they're pretty much meeting every day. Notice they're not meeting in hiding. I found that interesting. They're not hiding. They're meeting in public. Now understand something. They have been told by the same people that put Jesus to death, do not speak in his name anymore. And yet they're disobeying all human authority. They're preaching anyway. In the midst of their opposition, they seem to be unafraid. They seem to be very bold and very courageous. Knowing that they have been threatened, their lives have been threatened. They've already been thrown in jail. It's important to note that all of these believers so far are Jews. There's not a mention of a Gentile till later in the book of Acts. No one has dared join them. The pretenders have thinned out, but the believers are getting more and more powerful. But notice, they were highly regarded and respected by the crowds, even though the crowd kind of wanted to stay off at a distance, amazed, perplexed, astonished, and astounded. So how does this new church plant doing? In fact, I want you to realize this is a new church plant. Never has this ever been done. It's brand new. Nowhere else in the world is this happening. Right there in Jerusalem, the church is being planted. Now later it will spread out. So how's the new church plant doing? Now what's the context? They just carried out two pretenders and buried them. So how's the new church plant doing? Verse 14. Yet more and more people believed. How? How's this happening? Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord. Crowds of both men and women became believers. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and on mats so that Peter's shadow, are you hearing me? They're bringing people, the, the, the power of God is so manifest in these people that they're bringing sick people just so that when Peter walks down the sidewalk, his shadow hits them and they're healed. How's this new church plant going? As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. And crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits and they were what? All, all of them are healed. No, notice two things. Not just the uh, physical sicknesses. They're bringing in the physical sicknesses. And they're being healed because Peter's shadow touches them. But also they're, they're casting out evil spirits. It's the physical and the spiritual are being dealt with in Jerusalem. In this move of God called the church. Through a man of God called Peter. So how do you grow a church? This is a new church plant, never been done before in Jerusalem. So how do you grow a church? First, let me say, you don't. God does. God does. Secondly, the church grows when the church believes and obeys the word. The church grows when the people actually believe. No pretending. No pretending. The people actually believe and they actually obey the word of God and they, the people in the church allow the Holy Spirit to direct their daily lives. The Holy Spirit is directing Peter to heal the sick. And people are trying to put their sick friends and their sick relatives are coming from out of town. Anybody you know that's sick, get them to Jerusalem. Peter's there. Something's happening in Jerusalem. They're also bringing people that have evil spirits for Peter to cast out. Now, we're, we're getting into a whole new realm here, right? It's one thing to heal somebody who's got a bad leg, and, but you mean there's a, they can cast out a demon? There's demons? 
Yes, Peter had the power to cast out evil spirits. So here comes my question today to the church. Do you believe there are evil spirits? Today, today in modern world affairs, do you believe there are still evil spirits? Evil spirits, things, forces, powers that can come inside of human bodies and control them, manifest their will inside and through them. Do you believe that happens today? Notice the word possessed. Bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, they're all healed. The word possessed. Let's stop for a moment and talk about this one. I am possessed by a spirit. Some of you might think, well, that explains a whole lot after getting to meet you. I am possessed by a spirit. I want you to know, I make no apology today that I am possessed by a spirit. It's not an evil spirit, but I am possessed by a spirit. The word possessed means what? In possession of. I am in possession. I am possessed by the spirit of Christ. The word means the property of, under the control, under the influence of. So I, t I say gladly, rejoicing today, I sing a song that I am possessed by a spirit, the Holy Spirit. I am under the influence and the control and the power of the Holy Spirit. I am Jesus' possession. Listen, I belong to him. There was a transaction made. God the Father purchased me with the blood of His Son. He didn't come and take me. He offered me. He offered me salvation through His Son. I received that and I became His possession. I belong to Him. I am connected and operating under the authority and the power and the control of that which possesses me. I am under the possession of the Holy Spirit. There are people that are possessed by a different spirit. Not the Holy Spirit. There are people, listen, there are people possessed by a different spirit than Jesus. And i got to tell you, in case you're wondering, there's only two spirits. There's only two. Ultimately, there are only two authorities that can possess a person. Only two that you and I can belong to. Only two that can and will control us in the spiritual realm. Do you believe that? I wonder how many people in the church actually, actually believe that. That there's only two spirits and all of us are possessed by one of them today, right now. There is the Holy Spirit and there is the unholy spirit. And everyone is possessed by one of these two spirits Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Satan is the unholy spirit. This is not complicated. You don't have to guess. And everyone is possessed by either Jesus or Satan. Do you believe that? See, this is foundational. This, this, is, this is not far out stuff. This is foundational truth. Now, now, I got all of that to set up the good part. My favorite thing to tell you today is this truth Jesus has the power and the authority to cast out Satan, but Satan does not have the power or authority to cast out Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. There are two spirits, and those two spirits possess everybody. One of those two spirits. You, are, you belong to Christ or you belong to his adversary. The word belong means you are their possession. And I got to tell you, the good news today is that Jesus has the power to cast out Satan. Satan cannot cast out Jesus. Now, who do you want to belong to? This is big. And you know why it's big? Because this, what I just told you, is the power of the church. That's why the church is unstoppable. Because Satan can't stand out in front of the church and cast out Jesus. He can't do it. 
For those who believe and those who are possessed by the Holy Spirit, this is the church and this is big. These Jews in Jerusalem are coming to Peter and Peter is casting out demons. He is casting out unholy, unclean spirits, demons that are working under and for Satan. And they're coming next to Peter and Peter, listen, Peter says, you got to go. You got to go. Why didn't the demon just look at Peter and said, I ain't going. You got to go. Because Peter has Jesus inside of him. And when Jesus is there, he has the power to say, Satan, you got to go. And he goes. This is big. This is the power of the church. So where did Peter get the power? Where does this fisherman turned preacher get the power to cast out demons, evil spirits. This power over the unholy. This is big. This power over the unclean. This is big. It does not originate in Peter. It does not. This power does not originate in the apostles. This power is in Christ and Christ alone. Matthew 8, 16. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. Where's Peter get this power? I'm going to show you where Peter gets this power. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus, and he cast out the evil spirits with what? Some incantation? Did he have to get some smoke and get some fire and get some things? No, no. He cast out them with a simple command, be gone. Why didn't the evil spirit look back at Jesus and say, I'm not leaving? Because you don't understand how this works. He's leaving. He cast out evil spirits with a simple command. And notice that there's a connection. Even in this case, as with Peter in Jerusalem, the physical sicknesses and the spiritual sicknesses were both overcome by the name of Jesus. The power of Jesus. His word has the power to cast out demons. But demons, but demons can't cast out Jesus. This is the power of the church. Jesus had the spirit without limit. I want to explain something to you. The Gospel of John says something about this man named Jesus. It says he has the spirit without limit. Without limit. Limitless, infinite. No limit to the application of the Spirit, which means He is truly God in the flesh. God is inside of Him. That's why He has the Spirit without limit. And His Word releases the power over Satan. Demons, you got to go. Satan, you got to go. Jesus gave Peter the Holy Spirit. Now listen, Jesus has the spirit without limit, and he gave, the one who has the spirit without limit, gave Peter the Holy Spirit. He didn't give Peter the spirit without limit. Only Jesus has the spirit without limit, but he gives Peter the spirit. It has limits. Peter's not God, but he has Jesus inside of him. Jesus gave Peter the Holy Spirit, and Jesus gave Peter the Word. Two things. This is the church. He gave him the Holy Spirit and he gave him the Word. And the Word and the Spirit have power over Satan. Damons, you got to go. This is the church. If you, might, you might wonder, why, why, why do I keep making a big deal that the modern American church doesn't look anything like the church in the book of Acts? Perhaps this is it right here. The Spirit and the Word has power over Satan. And what's the modern American church that doesn't know the word? I didn't come here to entertain anybody. The modern American church does not know what's in this book. The spirit and the word have power over Satan. This is big. Before I read it, there are only two spirits. You belong to or possessed by one or the other. I'm going to read it to you and explain it to you. You in the room today, you are under the control of one of these two spirits. You, are, you belong to one of these two spirits. You are possessed, the possession of one of these two spirits. Nobody's neutral. 
If you think, well, I'm just going to kind of see how this thing works out and jump in. No, no, nobody's neutral. Matthew 12, 22. I'm going to show it to you. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and couldn't speak was brought to Jesus. Jesus healed the man so that he could both speak and see. You see how the physical and the spiritual are connected? The crowd was amazed and asked, could it be, could it be, is it possible that Jesus is the son of David? He is the Messiah. He's the Christ. But when the Pharisees heard about the miracle, they said, no wonder he, casts, he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and he replied, any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A town or family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan, Jesus is answering their, their, their thoughts, and if Satan is casting out Satan, that's what they're accusing him of, that Satan is in him, and because Satan has power, and Satan's in Jesus, and Jesus is casting out demons, Satan's casting out his own people. Jesus says if Satan's casting out Satan, he's divided and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. And if I am empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcist? They cast out demons too, so they will condemn you for what you have said. And here, this is big. This is big. Verse 28. And then Jesus says something. This, listen, this is the church. But if I am casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. This is the church. If I am casting out demons, if I, a man, have the power to say to Satan, you got to go, and he goes, then you must come to the conclusion that the kingdom of God has arrived upon the earth through the presence of a man. His name is Jesus. And here's, here's the detail. Verse 29. For who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan? Who's, who's, you want to go in Satan's house by yourself? Who is powerful enough to enter a strong man like Satan's house and plunder his goods? Who? Who? Do you know anybody? Only someone even stronger, someone who could tie him up. Can you tie him up on your own? You're going you're gonna to go into Satan's house, plunder his goods, and when he catches you, you're going to tie him up. You're going to do that? Who is strong enough to do that? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and plunder his house. Anyone who isn't with me. Listen, you want to, want, you, you want, to, you want to know where I get this idea there's only two spirits, there's only two choices, there's only two sides? Here's what he says. Jesus says, anyone who isn't with me opposes me. You're in or out. And anyone who isn't working with me, what? You're actually working against me. There's no neutral. There's no wait and see. Do you see the two sides? Do you see the civil war that's in the heavenly realms? Jesus is the only one that can enter Satan's realm and plunder him. Demons got to go. Jesus is the only one. The only one. No human's going to be able to do it. He is supernatural. He is an evil spirit. He is powerful. Nobody's going to plunder his good. I'm going to tell you what, he's plundering people. But people on their own do not plunder him. Unless there's a strong man that comes with you. On vacation Bible school last year, they sang a song. Sometimes we sing it at camp. I think it's a little bit too edgy for Chad to do it in church, even though I wish we'd have done it today. Some of y'all remember last year, it says, I got something to make the devil want to run. If I was brave, I'd sing that right now. And then you'd run, probably. I got something to make the devil want to run. Run, devil, run, devil, run, devil, run. That's that song that we sing at VBS and at camp. Jesus is living inside of Peter. Listen, all they're doing is that 
an evil spirit in a person gets in the shadow of Peter when he walks down the sidewalk. And the evil spirit has got to run. I got something to make the devil want to run. Run, devil, run, devil, run, devil, run. Who can do that? Is it Peter? Jesus is inside of Peter. There's a spirit inside of Peter. Peter is possessed by a spirit. And there's another evil spirit that cannot stand against that spirit. Demons got to go. But I'm going to give you a warning. Listen, in case you're feeling real brave right now because you're saying, well, I got something to make the devil want to run. I'm going to give you a warning. God the Father gave the Spirit without limit to His only Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus gives the Holy Spirit to His apostles, but not without limit. But He gives them great power and He gives them great authority. And here's my warning. Do not try to face the demonic realm of Satan without the Spirit. Do not try to face the demonic realm of Satan without the power of Christ and without the Word of God. Do not. He will plunder you. Run, devil, run, devil, run, devil, run. Not on your own, he won't. Not on your own. I want to show you why I say that today. I want to fast forward in the book of Acts to another man who was given the Spirit, not without limit. Only Jesus has the Spirit without limit. This man, like Peter, has the Holy Spirit. He has the anointing of God, special power. Physical, spiritual healing. He has a special power. He got it directly from Jesus. His name is Paul, the Apostle Paul. And and, in this, what I'm about to read to you, do not pretend to have the Spirit and face Satan. Do not pretend to be a Jesus follower and go face the demons. I'm going to read it to you. Acts 19, verse 11. God gave Paul the power We're not talking about Peter. We're we're talking about Paul now. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched Paul's skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. It sounds just like the Peter thing, right? It's the shadow of Peter doing the healing, and now it's just a handkerchief that, that that Paul touched. And now the evil spirits, devil, demons got to go. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town. Now, now listen, listen, listen. Paul's got the Holy Spirit. He's got Jesus inside. So the demons got to go, right? Demons got to go. And why? Listen, let me give you a visual image. When light comes, Jesus is the light of the world, right? In him, he, in him there is no darkness. So when the light comes, and Satan is the spirit of darkness, when the light comes, what do you think is going to happen to the darkness? When the light turns on, the darkness must leave. That's why when Peter's shadow touches the darkness, the darkness has to leave. Demons got to go. When when Paul's handkerchief touches the darkness, darkness, demon got to go. But what happens if you... Approach the darkness and you don't have the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm going to show you. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, and they're casting out evil spirits. Seems like the thing to do back in that time. Except they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantations, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. The problem is these particular guys, this this practice of doing what Paul did and getting what Paul got, it only is going to work if you've got what Paul's got, which is Jesus, inside of you. Verse 14, seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. What? They were calling on the one that Paul worships to run out demons. But one time when they tried, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus. Can you, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Let's make this real. These guys are trying to do some demonic exorcisms. And they tell the demon to go out and the demon talks to them. I know Jesus and I know Paul. But who are you? 
That might be a good time to recalibrate. <laughs> I know Jesus. This demon's talking. This guy's come out, run devil, run devil, run devil, run. And the demon says, I know Jesus. Yeah, I do. I know Paul. I don't know you. Who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them. Overpowered them. Attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked. You're in trouble if you run out naked. And battered. Does everyone have the power to cast out demons? No. No. But some people do. Those people are filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Word of God. Jesus gave this specific power to some before the cross. He gives this unique power to some before the cross. Matthew 10, 1. Jesus calls his 12 disciples together, and he gave them something. He gives it to them. They don't have it. He gave them the authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. You notice in all three of these applications, the physical and the spiritual are connected. All three of them. He's healing their physical needs and their spiritual needs at the same time. Don't get hung up only on the casting out demons part. But these men had the power for physical healing as well as casting out the evil spirits. Jesus then sends out 72 men. I don't have time to give you all the details, but I want you to understand. I believe that the sending out of the 72 is a preview of the church. I believe it's a, it's a picture of what's supposed to be happening right now among us. He gave them supernatural power. And I'm going to tell you, every person in here, if you have the Holy Spirit, you have been given a spiritual gift. He gave you something. And to him who has been given much, much will be required. And just like the church, he sent out the 72 and he gave them all a spiritual gift, a supernatural power. The church has been empowered with supernatural Holy Spirit and each of us, diff different gifts. Not everybody has the same gift. Praise God. We all got different gifts, making up the body of Christ that he's putting together. Unstoppable movement of God. All of us have a gift. Do you know what your gift is? Are you using it? He gives them supernatural power when he sends out the 72. And they came back to him after their mission trip and listened to how it turned out. The church could learn a lot from this scene. They, they, he sent them out, empowered them. He gave them something they didn't have on their own, sent them out, and here they come back. Let me read it to you, Luke 10, 16. Then he said to his disciples, anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me. And anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. And anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. And when the 72 disciples returned to Jesus, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, 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 even the demons obey us. Wow. Run, devil, run, devil, run, devil, run. And he runs. And the demons flee. Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them. And then he says something. Listen, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority. This is a preview of the church. And I'm sad to say that the modern American church doesn't look anything like the church in the book of Acts. Nothing. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Run, devil, run, devil, run, devil, run. And you can walk among snakes, scorpions. You know what? People read this, they want to look at snakes and scorpions. Let's go grab a snake, see if this thing works. And you miss the whole point of the power of the church. I have given you power and authority over the enemy. Demons have got to go. Darkness has got to go. When light comes, darkness has got to go. Verse 20, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Somebody say amen. amen. This is the unstoppable power of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
the power to overcome Satan and his demons, the power to plunder the house of Satan, the power to plunder him, not to just coexist alongside of him, but the power to take away from him. That's what belongs to him. Take it away from him. To plunder his house. To take those who are in the darkness, under his control, under his possession, away from him. What? By the power of the message. By the power of the gospel. By the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of truth. Turn on the light. Tell the truth. Run, devil, run, devil, run, devil, run. Did you notice that first verse, number 16? Then he said to his disciples, anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me. Jesus is connecting the message to himself. You reject the message, you're rejecting Jesus. What is the message? I'm reading it to you today in Acts chapter 5. Anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. And anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. There's only two sides. There's only two spirits. There's only two messages. But there's only one truth. We carry the message of Jesus, the gospel of Christ, the good news. We don't apologize for this message. But we also don't rejoice because evil spirits obey this authority, as if this authority belongs to us. No, we rejoice what? We rejoice in the cross of Christ. We rejoice in the power of Christ. Not the power of us. We rejoice that our names are written in heaven by the mercy and grace of God. Jesus sent the 72 out with a message. And now Jesus has sent the church out. That's you. That's me. He sent us out with a message. Reject this message and you are... Listen, reject this message. Everybody in the room, listen. Reject this message and you are the possession of Satan. You will have no excuse. Reject this message. I hold it high. And you are the possession of you are possessed. You say, I don't believe in possession. I don't care whether you believe in it or not. You are. Reject this message and you are possessed by Satan. Receive this message and you are possessed by Christ. Both cases, you are possessed by a spirit. One is evil, one is holy. They both exist in the spiritual realm and also in the physical realm. And they are at war with each other. The battle is for your soul, and the battle is for the kingdoms of men. Who will reign on the kingdom of man? Who will reign? Your kingdom come. Remember that prayer Jesus told us to pray? Lord, I pray for your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. First, let me say, our prayer should be first that his kingdom comes into our heart. That he reigns first, first, first inside of me. First inside of you. But then we pray after that, that his kingdom will come and reign on this present earth. And that he will dispel the darkness that reigns currently. In Ephesians 6, verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against what? Against, what? What's our battle? Against evil spirits in the heavenly realms. And you know what? Truthfully speaking, I wonder how many people in this church today, maybe seven, maybe we've got 750 people here today. I don't know. How many out of that people actually believe in evil spirits? That you are actually possessed, possessed, under control of, owned by one or the other. We're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, dark, dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Now, back to Jerusalem. Do you think Satan's going to stand by and do nothing as Peter reveals the message of Jesus Christ to all the Jews in Jerusalem? Don't miss the context. The apostles are healing the sick and they're casting out demons and evil spirits. They're turning Jerusalem upside down. They are. They're turning the city upside down. And then 
this happens. Verse 17. The high priest and his officials who were Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night and opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. Satan is jealous of Jesus. And Satan is using jealousy between the church and the Jewish leaders. This jealousy is not from God. Not what these guys have. It's coming from Satan. They arrested the preaching apostles and they throw them into jail. You see the two spirits? You see the war? The spiritual battle? Which spirit has the greatest power? If you want to understand something foundational, which spirit has the greatest power? The spirit of Satan working through these unbelieving Jewish men have cast these apostles into jail. Who's got the most power? Then here comes an angel. And an angel comes in and opens the gate. Let's them go. Who's got the power? Why don't, why don't the evil spirits stand there and say, you can't open the gate? Because there is one that is greater. There is one that is more powerful. Do you know what the angel told them to do? See, they've just been thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. You know what the angel who's going to let them out of jail tells them to do? Next verse, verse 20. Go to the temple and give the people the message of life. I'm holding it up. Well, wait a minute. Last time we did that, we got in jail. This might not be a really good idea, angel. Go to the temple and give them the message of life. So at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple as they were told and immediately began teaching. When the high priest and his officials arrived, they convened the high council, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. Then they sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail for trial. But when the temple guards went to the jail, uh oh, when the temple guards went to the jail, the men were gone. So they returned to the council and reported the jail was securely locked with the guards standing outside. But when we open the gates, they're gone. No one's there. What sets people free? We just see a scene where a group of people are set free from jail. Well, what sets people free? You might say an angel with a key works. But what sets people free? A message of life. A message of life. They go right back into public and they begin preaching the message again. Why aren't they afraid? They're in jail. They just got broke out of jail. Why, why, aren't, why aren't they hiding somewhere? Are they afraid? I guess you could say, yeah, they probably were afraid, but they were more afraid of failing God than making the Jewish leaders angry. You must also consider the fact that they might have been afraid of the angel that said, get to it. Go back and preach. The message of life. I'm holding it up again. The message of the two spirits. The message of the holy versus the unholy. The message of light versus darkness. The message of Jesus and Satan. To be possessed. Do you believe in the spiritual possession to be owned by a spirit power? What I'm about to tell you, I've never shared publicly. I've shared it privately on several occasions. In fact, I had several times this week, I decided I was going to do it and not going to do it because it's very personal for me. But I decided that it's what God wants me to do, so I'm going to share a story with you. It's probably 10, 12 years ago. I'm in bed at night, and I'm awakened. Something wakes me up. And to my right-hand side, as I wake up, there is a dark, shadowy figure standing beside the bed. Even now. It's a deeply frightening moment. I don't think I'm dreaming. I'm not sleepwalking, even though I'm prone to both. But I'm not. I feel the presence of darkness. There is a shadowy figure standing beside my bed. And I'm going to tell you, it terrifies me. Because I can see its image. I can see its outline. It's standing right beside me. It doesn't speak. It doesn't move. It's just there, over, looking over me. And I am, I mean, every, my adrenaline has just exploded. I am suddenly so awakened and so afraid. And the only thing I can do, the only thing, and I, it's not the kind of thing, what would you plan for? The only thing I do is I immediately sat up in the bed, and it, with a loud voice, I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, you have no authority in this house. You must leave. 
He's gone. Now listen, I don't really care whether you believe that or not because I know the truth. We're fighting a spiritual battle in the heavenly realms. And you and I are possessed by one of these forces, either the force of light or the force of darkness. And there is only one power that can plunder that darkness. There's only one name. And I said that name. And see, I'm convinced the only way, the only way saying that name really worked is that he lives in here. I belong to him. Run, devil, run, devil, run, devil, run. Demons got to go. I've never had that happen again. If it happens tonight, I'm going to do the same thing I did then. I'm going to say out loud the name of Jesus and proclaim that he, darkness, has no authority in my life because I belong to another. I am possessed by the other spirit. Thus, you have no power in this house. Acts 5, 24, when the captain of the temple guard and the leading priest heard this, what, the jail's empty. I don't know where they are. When the captain and the leading priest heard this, they were perplexed, wondering where it would all end. What's going on here? There's demons running. There's people healed. They're preaching Jesus as Messiah. Where's all this going to end? Then someone arrived with startling news. The men you put in jail are standing in the temple and they're doing it again. What would you think if you were one of those temple guards, leading priests? Would you think maybe, you know, we ought to back off these guys. Don't read over this. Listen. Listen, here's, here's my main point today. This is the church of Jesus Christ. This is the church. You are the church. Verse 26, the captain went to the temple guards and arrested the apostles. But without any violence. Why? For they were afraid. Who's afraid now? Who's afraid now? These guys just got out of jail, so they arrest them again, but they don't want to start any trouble because they're afraid the people would stone them. Then they brought the apostles before the high council where the high priest confronted them. Didn't we tell you? He's looking at Peter and John. Didn't we tell you that, that you never again to teach in this man's name? Quit saying Jesus' name! Instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. Holy versus unholy. The unholy versus the holy. Something about that name. Listen to the charge against the new church. You have filled Jerusalem with his name. May that be the charge against this church. That we have filled Anderson County. We have filled Central Kentucky. We have filled Kentucky with this man's name. And no, we're not going to apologize. No, we're not going to shut up. No, we're not going to go into hiding because there's opposition. Run, devil, run, devil, run, devil, run. There's a name that plunders Satan's house. This is the power of the church for those who are not afraid. Verse 29, Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. God versus human authority. Peter sees the two forces at work. I love how Ken Ham puts it. When I did a study that he had, he said, in the end, when all is said and done, there will be two. There will be God's Word and man's Word. Which one did you listen to? God's Word or man's Word? Then Peter releases the message. God has assembled a crowd Peter didn't assemble a crowd. He just got out of jail. God has assembled an audience. And what's Peter going to do? Is he going to apologize, lower his head, and go hiding? No. He takes advantage of this moment, and he delivers this message to those who do not yet know of this Holy Spirit. They do not know of this light that pushes out the darkness. But they're about to find out, verse 30, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, and you killed him by hanging him on a cross 
Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as prince, as savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit who is given by God to those who obey him. We and the Holy Spirit together are a witness and we cannot be silent. There's the gospel. Jesus died on the cross so that you could repent and be forgiven. We are witnesses of the Word. We are witnesses of the Holy Spirit. So will everyone then turn to Christ? Is that it? He preaches the gospel and everybody turns to Christ in repentance and the Holy Spirit falls. I wish that were true, but it's not. Will everyone in the room that day join this new church? Verse 33. When they heard this, when they heard Peter's sermon, the high council was furious and they decided they're going to kill him. There's two spirits. Let's kill him. Let's kill him. How's that fit into your mind today? How's that fit into your mind? What did they just do? They cast out demons and they healed sick people. Yeah, let's kill them. We don't want any of that in town. Does it make any sense? It's darkness. What if you were a preacher? What if you're Peter? Do you resign? What if you just got thrown in jail? Do you quit? You see, the big point is this power is not from Peter. And this movement is not of men. God has put one man in the Jewish council that day. What? They, they, let's kill him. Let's kill him. There's one man. Who's in charge? Is, are they, is this going to be the end of the church? Let's squish them. But there's one man, one man. I'm going to tell you, God is in charge. And he put one man in the audience that day. His name is Gamaliel, verse 34. But one member, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, who was an expert in religious law and respected by all the people, stood up. And he ordered that the men be sent outside the council chamber for a while. Then he said to his colleagues, men of Israel, take care of what you're, about, what you're planning to do to these men. Some time ago, there was that fellow Theodos who pretended to be someone great. About 400 others joined him, but he was killed and all his followers went their various ways. The whole movement came to nothing. After him, at the time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee, he got people to follow him, but he was killed too. And all his followers were scattered. I'm going to ask you a question. How many of y'all believe that Gamaliel was in the audience that day by chance? Do you think the unholy spirit had the power to stop Peter that day? To squish the church and the church is gone. Well, we tried. Let me repeat this from earlier. Jesus can cast out Satan. Satan cannot cast out Jesus. Let's see what God's going to do through Gamaliel. Next verse, verse 38. So my advice, Gamaliel said, leave these men alone. Let them go. If they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it is from God, but if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You will even find yourself fighting against God. He gets it. You can't stop God. You're only going to get yourself hurt. It's not Peter's church. It really, it's not Peter's church. So stopping Peter's not going to stop it because it's not Peter's church. Jesus had already told Peter whose church it was. Matthew 16, Jesus says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church. It's Jesus' church. And then he said, And all the powers of hell will not conquer, will not stop the church. So Gamaliel, when he finishes, they all hold hands, sing Kumbaya, and go home, right? Verse 40. The others accepted his advice. They called in the apostles and they had them flogged. They beat them. Then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus and they let them go. Would you call that a good day at church? Come on. Would you? Yeah, but that was fun. We all got whipped. Did you expect that? How would you respond to the threat of jail, to beating? 
If you'd stop talking about Jesus, we won't beat you. If you'll stop talking about Jesus, we'll, we won't put you in jail. How would you respond? Would you stop? What if the HR department where you work says that we don't want anybody bringing up any of this Jesus stuff? Would you? What would you do? You think this only applies to some old guys back in 2,000 years ago? Is this real today? Will you obey the powers of man or the powers of God? Because if you're in Christ, you've been commanded to go share the good news. To let the light shine in the darkness. Well, they don't let us do that at work. Well, they didn't let them do it there either. But they did it anyway. Verse 41. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day, every day, in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message. What? Jesus is the Messiah. They're rejoicing. Would you join this church? Come on. Would you join this church? Are you sure? Is there another one? I don't want that one. No, no, they're too serious. I want the one that tells stories. Makes it fun. I go home feeling all warm inside. I got some good news and I got some bad news. You ready? Say uh huh. You can still join this church. That's the good news. You can. God's grace is still given. You know what this church is? There's only one church. Maybe a lot of denominations, but there's only one church. From God's eyes, there's only one church. You know what the church is? The body of Christ. You can still connect your life to this body of Christ. You can be possessed by him. That's good news. I'm telling you today, there's still time for you to join this church. You know what the bad news is? Some will hate you for doing so. And Satan will become your adversary. And he will try to stop you from sharing the message of Jesus with those that he possesses. Every day in the temple, every day house to house, they continue to teach and preach what? Jesus is Messiah. So would you join this church? Would it help if I could tell you how it all ends? Because see, I think it does. It helps me. See, I know how this thing ends. I can tell you the end of this whole story. Do you remember earlier I said Satan can't cast out Jesus, but Jesus can cast out Satan? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, and the Holy Spirit has authority over Satan and his demonic spirits. Pretenders will just get hurt. But truly, Holy Spirit-filled believers face Satan with real power. This is the power of the church. Joining the church is actually joining Jesus by receiving the Holy Spirit of Christ inside of you. It's done by faith. And once you do it, once you believe, truly believe, no more pretending, no more rituals, once you really believe, the Word of God makes you this promise. There is no power in heaven or, on, or in hell. On the earth or under the earth that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me read verse 38, Romans 8. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Nothing! can separate you from the love of God. Jesus is going to cast out Satan one day. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. I know how the story ends. Jesus is going to cast out Satan one day. And everyone who is possessed by Satan, everyone who is possessed by Satan is going with him. Jesus has said, one day he's going to cast him out. And if he possesses you, you're going with him. You're going with him. John 12, 31. Jesus says the time for judging the world has come. When Satan, the ruler, when Satan, the ruler of this world, he's, he's the ruler right now. When Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. Jesus said, he said this as he was headed toward the cross. Jesus acknowledges that Satan is the ruler of this world. Did you hear him? Jesus acknowledges. He gives it. He says, right now, Satan is the ruler of this world. He is the spirit that possesses the people who belong to this world. 
Those who belong to this world belong to the one who currently rules the world. But when the Son of Man is lifted up, I will draw everyone to myself. There you go. Jesus' death on the cross was the defeat of Satan. By taking back from Satan what had been lost by the first Adam. What was lost? Life. Life. Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out by Jesus. He's going to be cast out. He knows. He's filled with rage and fury because he knows his days are short. He's going to be cast out. Because of the cross of Christ, Satan can't cast out Jesus. And if you're in Jesus and Jesus is in you, Satan can't cast you out either because Christ is in me and I am in him and we are in the Father. So Satan, run devil, run devil, run devil, run. He can't touch me if Christ is in me. But one day Jesus is going to cast out Satan, cast him into the lake of burning sulfur. I want to read it to you and I'll close. Revelation 20. Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. I'll ask Chad to come out for the invitation. Do you believe in spiritual possessions? Do you believe that there's only two spirits, the holy and the unholy? And that that spirit that possesses you owns you. And you're going to get what he got. If you're possessed by Jesus, you're going to get what he got. You'll be joint heirs with Christ in the kingdom of God, a child of God. You're going to get what he got. Why? Because he belongs. You belong to him. He owns you. Purchased. God purchased you as a child by the blood of but I'm going to tell you, if you don't belong to Jesus, you by default belong to his adversary. So today we're going to do an invitation time. The invitation is this. If you're in Christ and the Holy Spirit's in you, celebrate. Celebrate. This is your time to worship. Worship! He has set you free. Don't, don't sit there and go, yeah. <laughs> worship him. He is worthy of your song. But if you're outside of Christ today, the invitation is come. Surrender your life to Christ. By faith, receive the Holy Spirit. Run, devil, run, devil, run, devil, run. Let's stand. the only one who could ever 
Father, today, thank you for these three who are strong and courageous and they step out and said, yes, Lord, I will join. I will follow you and I am not ashamed of the gospel. Father, for the rest of us in this room, anoint us, seal us, empower us, commission us, send us out into this, into this dark world with this incredible light. The Spirit of Christ sets people free. We have a message of life. May we never be ashamed of this message. Father, we pray for the coming of Christ. And I pray when he does come, he'll find his church ready. He'll find us serving. He'll find us loving those who do not know by giving them the good news. In Jesus' name, and amen. Thank you for being here today. Welcome, brother. Welcome, brother.